I'm Tara Newell, and I survived being attacked by Dirty John Meehan, killing him in self-defense. I'm Collier Landry, and at 11 years old, I survived my father, Dr. John F. Boyle Jr., murdering my mother. I testified against him in court, sealing his fate. We've come together to interview fellow true crime survivors. Our goal is to give survivors back their power. By helping them tell their story, their way. Our show, The Survivor Squad, will be launching soon. In the meantime, head to our website, thesurvivorsquad.com to sign up for updates, send us your suggestions, and connect with us on social media. Thanks for listening. And we look forward to sharing more ethical true crime content with you guys soon. Explicit content is found in this episode, so listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to True Crime Cases. I'm your host, Lainey. The love triangle is a very popular trope in romance and young adult novels. The reader is driven throughout the story, wanting to find out whether our protagonist will choose the dark, brooding stranger or the warm and kind friend they've known since childhood. We've all encountered it in some form of popular media, and whether we love it or hate it, it seems like it's here to stay. But while this can be a fun situation to explore within the pages of a book, a particular podcast called Crimes of Passion, or our TV screens, the reality for people who experience it for themselves is much less fun. We're not talking about polyamory or open relationships situations which are often totally healthy and fulfilling for the people who enter them. These are cases where every person involved is informed and consenting to being a part of that relationship dynamic. What we are talking about is an individual toying with the emotions of two partners who either do not know about each other or discover their predicament when they're already so attached to said individual that the thought of leaving them is emotionally painful. In today's episode, we'll be looking at two cases where love triangles come to a deadly end. Okay, on to the show. Picture this. It's 3 a.m. on Saturday, June 12th, 2021, and the peaceful night shift for the police officers in Galveston County, Texas, is suddenly shattered by a single gunshot. The officers immediately respond to the call, leading them to a trailer home in Crystal Beach. But unfortunately, they arrive too late. As they enter the trailer, they find the lifeless body of a young man who had been shot in the chest. The victim is identified as Jordan Montre Turner Boxley, a recent college graduate who was only 25 years old. Shockingly, the trailer home belongs to his ex-girlfriend, Angelique Campbell, who is present at the scene along with another of her ex-partners, Darren Gills. Angelique tells police that Jordan was trying to force himself on her against her will. When Darren arrived, he immediately confronted Jordan to defend her. The two men got into a physical altercation, and Angelique claims she ran out of the trailer in fear. That's when she heard a gunshot. And shortly after, Darren emerged and informed her that he had shot Jordan. In a swift turn of events, police arrest Darren just four hours after being called to the scene of the murder. The next day, he is booked and his bail is set at a staggering $150,000. The officers on the scene quickly become suspicious of Angelique's retelling of events. There was no evidence of any kind of struggle neither Jordan attempting to assault Angelique nor the apparent fight between the two men that resulted in his death. There was also no indication that Jordan had been in possession of any kind of weapon during the alleged altercation. Because of these inconsistencies, police believed Angelique wasn't as innocent as she was claiming to be and got a search warrant for her phone. Their instincts almost immediately proved to have merit. According to Angelique's phone, She and Darren had only recently broken up in the couple of weeks leading up to the incident, but Angelique was desperate to get back together with him. In a disturbing text exchange, Darren told her to catch a body if she wanted him back in her life. Rather than question his request, 
Angelique agreed to it and set up a scenario where Darren could kill Jordan. She didn't even question whether Darren was being serious. She just agreed to his terms. Angelique was sure she could not kill anyone herself. Instead, she said that she would just set up the scenario where Darren could kill their intended victim and, quote, just stab him or something. So, she lured Jordan over to the trailer with the promise of sex. On the night the murder took place, the pair were still texting each other even during the last moments of Jordan's life. Angelique told Darren where Jordan was sitting in the room and said she was scared and that she wanted to leave. As the evidence mounted against them, both Darren and Angelique eventually admitted to their roles in Jordan's murder. She told them that Darren had been hiding in the bathroom when Jordan arrived, and that he had told her to make sure Jordan was sitting with his back to the bathroom so he would not see him coming. Angelique also revealed that she had managed to lure Jordan over with the promise of sex, and he came over despite being hesitant to accept the invitation because it was already late at night and he had work in the morning. From there, it was mostly a matter of processing their guilty pleas through the court system, though the trials for Darren and Angelique would be severely delayed by the COVID-19 pandemic. But finally, on January 23, 2023, Darren Cordell Gills pled guilty for the murder of Jordan Montre Turner Boxley. Darren was sentenced to 40 years in prison while Angelique received a 27-year sentence, and under Texas law, both parties will be eligible for parole after serving half of their sentence. Jordan's family and community mourned the loss of a young man with a bright future ahead of him, whose life was cut short by senseless violence. Jordan Montre Turner Boxley was a beloved member of the community who took part in numerous Bible school and youth activities with his church, the First Union Baptist Church. He will be remembered as a kind-hearted and accomplished individual, loved by all who knew him. His family will always cherish the memories of his contagious smile and gentle nature. He earned a bachelor's degree in business finance, intending to pursue a career in real estate, and was honored by his church family for his successes in further education. He is survived by his parents, Ladenia Boxley and Raymond Turner Jr., and five siblings, Nicholas, Chris, Trayvon, Gerard, and Reynard. The second case in today's episode takes place 15 years before and an ocean away from our first. Americans spend 90% of their time indoors, but indoor air could be two to five times more polluted than outdoor air, causing health risks. Almost half the population lives in areas with unhealthy air pollution levels. Airborne allergens like pollen, pet dander, and mold are common triggers for allergies and asthma. Introducing Air Doctor, an air purifier that has been featured by CNN, Money, ABC, and more. With its Ultra HEPA filter, Air Doctor removes 99.99% of bacteria and viruses, including particles as small as 0.003 microns. It can circulate the air in a 630-plus square foot room four times per hour and comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Use promo code TCFC at airdoctorpro.com for up to 39% off or up to $300 off. I've had my air doctor for about a week now, and I've noticed a tremendous difference. I have three dogs, one cat, so that means lots of hair and pet dander all over the place circulating through the air, and it always triggered my allergies. Now I have the Air Doctor, which is literally right next to my bed, filtering the air in my bedroom, and it has made such a tremendous difference. So don't miss your opportunity to get the Air Doctor with the discount code TCFC. Remember, go to AIRDOCTORPRO.com for up to 39% off or up to $300 off depending on the model. Els van Doren was a 38-year-old mother of two who lived in northern Belgium, close to the border with the Netherlands. She spent her weekdays working alongside her husband, Jan de Wilde, in their family jewelry store, and spent her weekends seeking adrenaline. Her sport of choice? Skydiving. Els was an incredibly experienced skydiver who went skydiving with the Swartzburg Parachuting Club every weekend without fail. 
and had taken part in 2,300 jumps by late 2006. She spent a lot of her time away from her home and family to be with the club, whose members she was very close with, two particular friends being Marcel Summers and Els Klotmans. But this would all end on November 18, 2006, when the parachuting club of 12 took off from Zwartberg's small aerodome in a Cessna light aircraft to go for their weekly dive over Flanders. They usually did this on Saturdays, but bad weather postponed the exercise until the next day. Els, Marcel's, Klotmans, and another man were some of the last divers to jump from the plane. They had planned to jump at the same time and link hands to perform aerial maneuvers as they dived, free-falling in a star formation. They would then separate in order to safely deploy their parachutes. However, Klotemans was delayed during the process of jumping and ended up being just a fraction too late to join the others. A video camera mounted on Els's helmet captured the events that followed. Initially, everything seemed to be going according to plan during Els's fall, just like the 2300 skydive she had done before in her life. But then, when the signal to open parachutes was given, Els encountered a serious issue. Her main parachute failed to open, and the pilot chute, which is a smaller parachute that is designed to automatically deploy before the main parachute, had also failed. It ended up detaching from the pack and fluttered away when Els tried to tug at it. In a last-ditch effort to regain control of her fall, Els attempted to deploy her secondary reserve parachute, which is contained in the pack in case of emergencies such as this. However, even the reserve parachute failed to deploy, dashing Els's hope of landing safely as she struggled desperately in midair. Marcel had noticed Els was in trouble and tried to get closer to her so he could help. Despite Marcel's attempt to approach and assist, he was unable to reach her in time. Els Van Doren tragically plummeted 4,200 feet to the ground and was killed instantly. The impact created a loud thud in the back garden of a house in a small village called Op Klebeek. The shocking event left the residents and fellow skydivers horrified. Els's terrifying descent lasted only a few seconds. The footage from Els' helmet camera played a crucial role in the subsequent investigation. The police could immediately rule out her death as a suicide because they had visual and audio proof that Els had struggled to save her life in every way possible. This was further corroborated by those who had been with her at the time of her death, including the plane's pilot, who stated, Els tried everything to try and save herself. She tried to open the reserve parachute, but it wouldn't open. That never happens. As the investigation into Els's tragic skydiving accident unfolded, a chilling revelation emerged. Upon examining Els's parachute pack, the police made a startling discovery. Key cords of her parachutes had been expertly and deliberately cut, in such a way that a routine pre-flight inspection of the pack would not uncover the sabotage. It was now crystal clear Els Van Doren had been murdered. The question that remained was, who would do this? who would target Els, a woman who seemingly lived a quiet life with her children and husband. As the police continued their investigation, they discovered that the motive was, yet again, a love triangle. Els had been keeping a secret from her family and friends. She was leading a double life. For years, she had been having an affair with fellow skydiver, 25-year-old Marcel Summers. Marcel's home in Eindhoven, Netherlands, was a refuge for Els, and she would stay with him whenever she had the chance, relishing their weekends together. In fact, just two days before her tragic death, she had slept over at Marcel's home with Els Klotemans. Again, their mutual friend from the parachuting club, she ended up sleeping on the couch. This revelation shed new light on Els's personal life, and added complexity to the investigation surrounding her untimely demise. To the police, learning of this affair made two men likely suspects in Els's murder, her husband, Jan de Wilde, and her lover, Marcel Summers. Of course, this development is not shocking to our listeners. 
However, both men were considered to be innocent until proven guilty in the months following her death. Jan had no idea and no knowledge of his wife's affair until it came to light after her murder, and it seemed unlikely that he had the expertise to sabotage her parachute in such a meticulous manner. Though Marcel did have that knowledge, he claimed that Els was the love of his life and never would have hurt her. It wasn't until after their investigation and interrogations with Marcel that they unearthed a third, previously unconsidered suspect, 26-year-old Els Klotmans. And we're going to continue referring to her by her surname to make this easier to follow. The police had not previously looked closely into Klotmans because she had been such a close friend with the victim and seemed distraught following her death. In the 10 months before the incident, the two had spoken to each other on the phone over 200 times, and Els had even given her the nickname Babs, so that fellow skydivers would stop confusing them with each other. Klotmans was a trainee elementary school teacher who met and befriended Els and Marcel back in 2004, and quickly became close with both of them, though maybe not as close as she wanted to be. What Els was apparently unaware of before her death was that Klotmans had also begun having an affair with Marcel. According to the BBC Online, Klotmans would spend Fridays with Marcel, while Els would be with him on Saturdays. Marcel's claimed he found it impossible to shake off Klotmans and bitterly regretted this relationship. But it seems that Klotmans did not feel the same way. Marcel later reported that when Klotmans had stayed at his home at the same time as Els, she had actually shown up uninvited, persistent in her pursuit of the man and happy to disregard his boundaries to do so. This information shed light on Claudeman's behavior, indicating a potential motive for her involvement in the case. And during this stay at Marcel's home, she had slept in the same room in which Elle's parachute was kept. Claudeman's status as the prime suspect was solidified when she attempted suicide just hours before her second scheduled interview with the police. This act raised further suspicion, leading police to view it as a sign of guilt. So, two months after the murder, in January 2007, Claudemans was charged and arrested due to the compelling evidence against her, even though Claudemans vehemently denied involvement in Elsa's murder. She continued to protest her innocence for several months while she was in custody pending further investigations. She insisted that Els had been a very dear friend and close confidant, and that she was the only one who knew me. Regarding betraying Els's trust by sleeping with Marcel, Claudemans claimed he had led her astray, and that she always knew that she was number two for Marcel, while Els was number one. Though that could be considered as proof that police were correct in their belief that jealousy was a strong motive for her killing Els. Claudemans insisted that she never had a problem with being considered number two because she had such low self esteem. Claudemans was released on bail in 2008, at which point she was bizarrely permitted to finish her training to become a teacher and began teaching at a Belgian elementary school full time. Her family and friends claim that during this bail period, she acted mature and calmly, nothing like the vicious, scheming murderer the media and police were portraying her as. However, this period of calm was short-lived, as her trial held in Tonger in Belgium commenced jury selection on September 24, 2010, and lasted less than a month. The trial and the entire case garnered significant attention from the media. According to The Independent, the story of the murders had even been adapted into a plotline for a popular Belgian detective series on TV. So many members of the press attempted to show up at the trial that an additional room had to be provided in the courthouse for journalists to attend the proceedings via remote video. The reading of the final verdict was also live on multiple Belgian television networks. Clonemans reportedly remained emotionless on the first day of the trial and only spoke to confirm the most basic details about her identity, such as her date of birth and her employment. 
Her defense team firmly stated the belief that she had not killed a woman she considered to be a very close friend. The defense had an advantage in that all of the evidence against Clodemans was purely circumstantial. There were no witnesses who could attest to her tampering with the parachutes, no DNA or fingerprint evidence linking her to the cut cords, or even a pair of scissors or a knife in her possession. What the police did have against her, however, was compelling on its own. Means, motive, and opportunity. Clodemans had the expertise and knowledge to sabotage the parachutes. She wanted a relationship with Marcel, and she had been alone with the parachute packs only days before the murder. The prosecution's biggest hitters were motive and opportunity, asserting that Clodemans murdered Els out of a jealous rage over having to share her lover. They claim that while Els and Marcel's were in bed the night Clodemans invited herself over unannounced, Clodemans was so annoyed by the pair's lovemaking that she went to where the parachutes were in the house and cut the cords, something that experts estimated wouldn't have taken much longer than 30 seconds in total. In the 68-page indictment read by the prosecutor Patrick Boyan, he said, As a skydiver, she had the knowledge and opportunity to sabotage the parachute. On top of that, she had a relationship with Marcel, who also had a relationship with the victim, giving the accused a motive to have Marcel for her alone. The jury was shown the video footage from Elsa's helmet-mounted video camera, watching her death from her own point of view. The court witnessed Els begin the dive with confidence, then notice her chute had not deployed, and finally spend the last moments of her life desperately grappling with her parachute pack. The footage ended as Els made impact with the ground. It was pointed out by Jeff Vermossen, a lawyer representing Els's family, this video would have caused the family unimaginable pain. The first question a family normally asks is whether the victim suffered, whether she knew what happened. We don't have to ask. It was filmed. Try to deal with that as a family. Clodemans' defense team fought adamantly for her innocence, pointing the finger of blame at the other two obvious suspects, Elsa's husband, Jan, and her and Clodemans' shared lover, Marcel. Chief defense lawyer Vic Van Eist reminded the jury that there wasn't any forensic evidence that tied her to the killing, and the prosecution had nothing but circumstantial evidence. Van Ice told the court, I read no guilt, and I see no guilt. We will not deny that Miss Clodemans has had some problems, but she certainly is not a psychopath. However, this went against the reports of three psychologists who testified in front of the jury. They claimed Clodemans was deeply psychotic, but able to keep up a facade and cold with no emotions, which altogether made her a danger to society. The psychologists believed the cause of Clodemans being deeply disturbed was her father's death, which occurred when she was only two. It was also revealed that she had sought out psychological help after a suicide attempt at the age of 16. The jury then heard from Marcel Summers, who gave his testimony over video and described what he thought happened the night both women had stayed over. When Els and I went to bed, Babs kept turning it over. Something cracked, he said. She took a pair of scissors and cut the parachute cords. For me, that's the most realistic scenario. One piece of physical evidence presented to the jury were a series of anonymous letters, which the prosecution claimed were penned by Clonemans. They had been sent to mutual friends of Clodemans and Els and contained details about Els's affair with Marcel. Similarly, Clodemans was accused of bombarding Marcel with anonymous phone calls in 2005, showing how deep her obsession with the man went. In closing arguments, Jeff Vermossen, the attorney for Els Van Doren's family, summed up the character of Els Clodemans, saying that she carries an unspeakable anger within her. It has led to the most horrible type of attack, murder. She is totally intensive and feels no empathy. On her final day in court, Elsa's children left the courtroom as Clodemans spoke. She yet again claimed her innocence, saying, For four years now, I have been accused of something I did not do. That does something to you. 
they questioned me, saying, It's you, it's you, but it is not me. The jury, however, disagreed with her. Despite the complete absence of hard evidence leaking Clodemans to the murder of Alice Van Doren, she was found guilty of premeditated murder. During sentencing, the judge decided that the only mitigating circumstance in her case was the aforementioned psychological conditions that had led to her suicide attempts, but this would not gain her much lenience. On October 21, 2010, she was sentenced to 30 years in prison. Clodemans appealed the conviction almost immediately, claiming that the investigators had questioned her for more than 100 hours, despite not having a lawyer present. This was not found to be a compelling enough reason for retrial or resentencing, however, and was denied in May 2011. Even though the circumstantial evidence is overwhelming, agreed on by police, the jury, and the judge, the fact still remains that no forensic evidence was ever found to condemn Clodemans beyond a reasonable doubt. So, the whole case has left some internet sleuths asking, did she really do it? We'll leave that question up to you to decide for yourselves. In fiction, love triangles can be thrilling, mysterious, magical, and enticing, ending with one of the three amicably remaining friends, while the two who were really meant for each other end up together forever. But in reality, love triangles are messy, complex, and show a deep lack of respect towards the partners being forced to compete for the affection of the same individual, ending in heartbreak, hostility, and jealousy. And sadly, in both of these cases, the deaths of two young people, whose only crime was to love someone in the wrong place at the wrong time. Okay, listeners, thank you for joining me this episode as we file away another true crime case. If you like our podcast, please review us on Apple Podcasts or your podcast player of choice. It's a big help. Follow us on social media. We're active on Twitter for now at true crime underscore cases. Facebook at facebook.com slash true crime cases W Laney and Instagram at true crime cases with Laney. Our website is truecrimecasespodcast.com and we'd love to hear your episode suggestions for either love bites or for the regular feed. Send us an email, tcfcpod at gmail.com. This episode was researched by Susie St. John and Olivia Holmesley. Written by Jesse Hawk with content editing by Lainey Hobbs. Audio engineering produced by the best in the business, Neeks at We Talk of Dreams. Check him out on Twitter at We Talk of Dreams or WeTalkOfDreams.com. And I'd like to welcome to the club our most recent Patreon supporters, Lee Collins, Billy, and Kim M. Thank you so much for your support. And thank you to our Apple Plus subscribers. It is so cool that you guys are subscribing on there. I think it's awesome. If you have an episode that you want only exclusive for your feed, let me know.